yeah so today's uh, session is about frescoes and uh, tempera paintings the theory part of it and uh, this particular session is we can't discuss everything about frescoes and temperas uh, murals basically in such a short time span it is just a basic introduction an introductory discussion about uh, the type these types of murals so let's see what we are going to discuss uh, in this session we'll talk in general about what are wall paintings and murals just a few things about uh, murals then frescoes to tempera this is basically uh, just to express that um, it is uh, there are many paintings in the history that are not just frescoes or tempera there is a whole range of uh, techniques in between some are a mixture of fresco and tempera so you have fresco bomo and fresco seco both together in one painting so this is just we'll just go through all the two three possibilities in between and then we'll also talk about uh, the history of fres frescoes and um, anatomy of frescoes some chemistry of frescoes um, what actually is uh, different in frescoes chemistry uh, than other murals or tempera paintings and the nature of colors that are used in frescoes and since there are so many of uh, the natural pigments that are used in um, these frescoes it won't be possible to discuss all of them over here but i'll take just a few important and interesting pigments okay there are some more participants um, and i think i wasn't required to allow them in so back to the presentation uh starting from the basic definition about murals so the word mural is derived from latin word murus french mur therefore the paintings done on walls are known as murals here i would like to say something because uh, i am basically from india my other european languages are not very good uh, as far as pronunciation is concerned though i have tried my uh, best in most of the slides to pronounce uh, correctly but it, the uh, the pronunciation might differ from the local language so we just i just mentioned that uh, murals means paintings done on walls because the word mural means um, wall uh, mur means wall murus means wall so painting done on the wall is called mural now right from the prehistoric times of course uh, human beings have been painting on wherever they were staying they were living whether they are the walls of the caves or uh, uh, the houses they had made palaces or whatever and initially we'll say that the paintings uh, on walls the prehistoric paintings they were the wall wasn't prepared properly the painting was done directly on the wall structure whether, whether it is cave stone whatever and but as uh, the building technique was evolving um, the wall was being prepared or plastered with uh, different kinds of plasters like mud plaster or lime plaster and paintings were done on these prepared walls so uh, here you can see uh, i'll just take uh, my pen <clears throat> this portion <clears throat> is uh, the wall structure it is basically stone in this particular case we have uh, worked on this side and we know it is not brick it is there are big stone <coughs> sorry um <clears throat> cut in a uh, brick shape and uh, the structure the wall was created by these stone pieces now this wall is uh, prepare uh, is prepared by applying two or three layers of um, plaster and then the painting was done over it so uh, because this discussion is about uh, on frescoes and tempera so we'll mainly talk about 
uh, lime plaster, which is very interesting as far as uh, the fresco technique is concerned. It is all based on lime because lime is acting as the binding material. <clears throat> Sorry. So, uh, though mud plaster is also very common as far as uh, the sites that I have uh, worked upon or visited in India, we have a um, lot many buildings, very good, nice palaces, th which have the original, the basic layer on the wall of mud plaster with a lot of fiber and aggregates. And over that mud plaster, they have applied a thinner layer of lime on which the paintings were made. So uh, the painting is basically made on the lime plaster. And since we are talking about frescoes and tempera, our main focus would be on lime rather than mud plaster. Lime itself acts as a binder if the pigments are applied on wet lime. If it is dry, then it won't act as a, it cannot act as a binder. How this happens, we'll talk about in the chemistry part of this uh, session. So lime plaster itself is acting as a binder in certain cases where the pigment is applied on the wet lime. And such paintings, such application of pigments is called they are called fresco paintings, uh, which comes from another word, uh, Italian word, which means fresh. When pigments are applied on dry lime plaster, some binder is required to mix with the pigment because otherwise the pigment won't bind with the plaster. The plaster is already dry. It won't stick on the wall. So some kind of binder like some animal glue or vegetable glue is required or maybe um, uh, egg yolk or egg white in certain cases and in certain um, paintings the whole egg has been used as a binder. So such paintings where binder has uh, is being added to the pigment um, for painting the technique is called tempera. Now here there, these are some pictures of a site where we are still working and uh, these are the pictures which we took in, on our first visit and uh, you can see that how the wall is being prepared in different layers. Um, this is the brick structure, the first layer, then the second layer, Aricho and the third one and then Intonaco is the last one which is not visible here but in the upper areas we can see. So uh, the plaster is applied in different layers and uh, they become, uh, uh, they keep on getting better as you move away from the wall uh, as far as the fineness is concerned. Uh, it is less and less rough, more fine, plain and thinner also. Another picture uh, showing the same thing. Here we have this brick, then we have a rough layer of plaster with more of aggregates like uh, sand and pieces of stones or rock and uh, another layer over it and then into Nako and the paint layer. Another picture showing various layers. Since this uh, this particular area was all destroyed, it was it, uh, it has very less number of paintings left. Uh, though uh, another area in the same on the same site, we have a lot of uh, wall paintings still intact, and we are working on them also. So this was a little about murals that. Um, walls have been used to paint and decorate and um, initially maybe in the prehistoric times they were not prepared properly but um, as the construction and the uh, materials were being evolved um, the uh, walls were being uh, prepared well uh, with different kinds of plasters. Now that uh, the different techniques that fall between fresco and tempera. Uh, before I go to that, I would like to explain this uh, particular um, picture in the background. If you see the painting, the portion just behind the text, it is the white background with a maroonish reddish flower and uh, Actually, this was the portion which was covered with a wooden frame and uh, it was hiding the earlier painting. And the new painting was just painted over uh, the portion which was uh, visible and because that uh, frame wasn't removed. Uh, and uh, 
the painting with a white background this particular just behind the fresco where we have written the text um, this is in proper fresco technique as we have interviewed the person who had executed this fresco in early 20th century um, their grandchildren and they are now very old and um, they explained how their grandfather was painting at this particular site and uh, the new paintings are of course now not in fresco because they are <clears throat> over painted and this is what we'll see in a lot of uh, on a lot of sites um, throughout the world that the old paintings are covered with new paintings either after uh, roughening the surface um, uh, to, uh, to form a kind of grip for the upper layer, paint layer. And at times, even that is not done and the old paintings are just whitewashed and new paintings are uh, created on top of them. So we'll see all of these uh, such kind of cases and what they are called, but we'll first start with Fresco Bouon. And uh, this is the uh, pure, uh, true Fresco uh, where the complete uh, application of pigment or paint is uh, uh, till the time the uh, plaster, lime, uh, lime plaster is wet because as it dries, it, uh, there's a chemical reaction taking place and uh, it binds the pigment in the process. So um, this particular technique uh, is where the paint is applied when the lime plaster is wet, it's still wet. It is not applied after that. The paint pigments are not applied after that. Now paintings on wet lime plaster, uh, I would just like to uh, mention that the oldest paintings, we'll see in later slides, the oldest ones uh, that we have seen, they are around uh, from around 3,500 BC means for 5,000 years um, back. And uh, so we, the oldest known uh, fresco paintings, true fresco paintings are from, um, from that period. And the standard medieval binding medium for wall paintings was lime. Uh, in that period also 600 to 1,580. Now, if a particle of pigment is surrounded by lime water, in this particular case, this is what is happening. You can see in the background picture, this I have taken from internet, but it would, uh, um, it, it uh, shows that kind of thing that um, uh, the pigment is ingrained in the surface, lime plaster. So if a particle of pigment is surrounded by this lime water and the water dries away, the particle of pigment gets caught in the net, um, like, uh, uh, in the net of lime crystals like a fly in a spider's web. So uh, the pigment particle particles dry with the plaster as a part of it and not as a surface layer. I'll just explain this in the diagram. If you can see this diagram on the right, which has just appeared, um, this brownish thing, this is the Arecio and this is Intonaco and um, the pigments are embedded in this Intonaco and uh, the upper layer of lime and uh, they are not on the surface so the paint layer is not a separate layer as the earlier two so it is uh, it is a pigments are part of the intonaco or the lime plaster so this is not the case and how this binding action with lime happens will be discussed a little later in the chemistry part now, there were also, apart from these uh, true frescoes, where the whole process was of painting was done when the lime is wet, there are many paintings, a very great deal of medieval paintings, um, a painting was done on walls which had previously dried. So there are many paintings we have seen that they are, um, execute, the paintings are executed on a wall which was earlier dry, but it was dampened down just before painting. So it was dampened down with lime water 
and uh, a little lime or lime water was mixed with either it was uh, dampened down with the lime water before the paint was color was applied it was left for sometimes it was left for overnight and uh, then the color was applied or uh, here i would like to emphasize a little uh, lime water was mixed with each color as it was applied so uh, both these things were done first the dry wall was dampened with lime water and a little lime or lime water was mixed with each color as it was applied or maybe at times just one of these processes was done so there there are many paintings which are done on walls which had previously dried but they were dampened with lime water and um, some lime water was also mixed with the color as it was applied so this is another uh, kind of uh, you can say fresco but the true frescoes again came became popular uh, around 14th century in italy it became a common practice it was actually uh, because a lot of mosaic painting was um, popular uh, just before this 14th century and uh, it was losing popularity uh, maybe because it was very expensive or, or uh, something like that uh, i have to be sure because i don't know much about that history but uh, what i have read i think because of mosaic painting popularity of mosaic painting just before that and it was uh, getting and those artists uh, they were used to work on little areas at a time which was still wet now in 14th century in italy it became a common practice to plaster walls in pits and to paint on the fresh plaster with untampered colors simply mixed with water leaving the lime of the plastered wall to act as the binder for the pigment so small portions were uh, worked upon and this is also the case that uh, um, we just worked on a few years back and uh, i had put that picture in the beginning of this um, this um, presentation and uh, i think there would be some more pictures on that so there there are different sections made just like uh, the picture in the background uh, squareish or rectangular uh, portions are made and one portion is uh, painted at a time so this uh, became uh, this was revived in 14th century this is another kind of uh, frescoes that we see that i just talked about they are not they won't be called frescoes anymore because they are using a dry surface uh, of earlier fresco so quite too often in the history of paintings old walls decorations have been used as carriers for uh, new work the old plaster has been sc scored and scratched to provide a good bond for the new and the old surfaces ruthlessly covered and repainted sometimes the older members of these palimpsests have not been roughened but simply plastered over or merely washed white washed in preparation of the new decoration so this term for such paintings the term used is palimpsests and this term is more common with the manuscripts because in earlier times uh, the parchment uh, was uh, used for writing and uh, the paper was uh, uh, reused many times uh, uh, if the earlier one wasn't important and something new was to be created and even for uh, the uh, master <coughs> paintings so uh, secco painting secco means dry so the fresco secco is um, actually uh, the paintings done on dry lime plaster here i'm i would like to explain the picture on the right on the top there are two panels two portions uh, painted on a wall which i took a picture uh, i visited the site by chance and i was curious and i went inside it was on the first floor but the floor was breaking so i couldn't stand there and click good pictures and um, so but i took whatever pictures i could take and after i think um, nearly 7 or 8 years i got the work to uh, i got to work on the same site but now the whole floor was uh, gone and the walls were falling apart there was a lot of vegetation on the wall paintings so the middle picture um is uh, on the right is 
uh, when I went there after so many years. And uh, the bottom picture is uh, after the removal of this vegetation. And uh, uh, I'll explain why I'm talking about all this in the seco painting part. This vegetation was mainly algae, fungi, and uh, a lot of other material because the, even the roof of this floor was broken and it was all exposed, it was in ruins. And um, if you compare the first and uh, even the middle picture, you'll see, I don't know if you can see uh, the top picture, uh, if there is no, uh, am I visible over there? I don't know in the Zoom webinar because uh, the speaker is visible on the right side. I don't want that because on the right picture, there are some these uh, in the middle picture I'm encircling the same portion if I, oh, I can move this. So here, so there are uh, demons and um, saintly people on one side, the demons on the other side. And we know the story, the Indians know the story, but um, I just want to show that uh, here the demons have beard and hair and everything, but here the hair, all the black uh, uh, decorations are gone. The beard is not there, the hair is lost. So this was already done. This damage was already done even uh, before this maybe while this vegetation was growing on these walls and the roof has gone and there was um, uh, of course i know when i even when i i was visiting this site there was very rough weather heavy rains storms and all so but this damage is i think because of uh, water and uh, abrasion and so and if you see the bottom picture all the details you see are gone but even after such a um, rough kind of uh, damage, just a minute. So uh, the layer, I think, which was not done in fresco, which where the pigment was not bound by the plaster is not a part of the plaster is lost but the paint which was done in fresco means in fresh lime uh, is still there even after such a rough kind of deterioration so here i would like to mention there are many paintings uh, where half the paintings means uh, the earlier uh, portion of the painting is done in fresco and the details are added later in seco so the painting method that depending depended on the action of lime only that is fresco was supplemented by the use of binding medium like egg tempera but this was confined to developing an effect already partially established by the fresco layer so there are many paintings which are done basically first in fresco and then the details are added in the seco with the seco technique now why it is done why this kind of uh, thing is done uh, so what i found is that there are two reasons certain colors especially blacks and blues were diluted and dimmed by the whiteness of the crystallized lime binder so they were usually applied with egg or size uh, because uh, we have seen that uh, I just mentioned that the pigment is uh, uh, it uh, is trapped in the net of lime, so there are some there's some haziness on the top of it. So the they become dull these colors, especially blues and blacks. And blue we'll see here in this uh, discussion. They are already they are not very good in in case of fresco paintings. Secondly, lime, lime painting, whether on dry wall or in fresco, did not lend itself readily to the deliberate execution of fine details. And it was quite usual practice to depend on the finishing with egg or size. So earlier the painting was done in fresco, but uh, you can't uh, make the fine details with the fresco technique. Um, so those fine details were done with the um, um, 
bind uh, with a pigment with a binding medium like egg or size here i would like to mention that the picture where we saw um, that uh, fresco painting was over painted that was from a very sacred site and uh, this is what we see there also the the uh, the paintings which were in fresco which are underneath the upper layer of the new paintings they were very beautiful but they didn't have that kind of uh, outlines and very fine kind of brushwork but uh, the up paintings on top of uh, that fresco layer they were uh, very detailed very minute miniature kind of work was done on them and i don't know if i'll get time in this session to show you more such uh, pictures uh, to to just emphasize this point so tempera painting this is one such picture this is uh, this is a picture from uh, the same site um, and these are painted over the fresco paintings and they have this is not a close up but they have even in this like i'll just encircle if uh, i get the pen right pen so in this area yeah so uh, in this particular area here it is blank but uh, since there were many such walls this is just one little portion buildings the all the sacred sites uh, of that community were painted in a miniature style and they were so beautiful and so miniature and that kind of detailed work cannot be done in fresco and even if we look uh, have have a closer look at these pictures uh, they have a very minute work so tempera paintings now they are not done on the wet plaster and um, uh, they are done on um, dry plaster so they need the pigments need some binding material and the true tempera are basically the uh, paintings which are done with pigments uh, and egg uh, yolk or in some cases egg white is used and in some cases the whole egg was also used so um, temp uh, in tempera paintings the true tempera though uh, there are uh, cases like in india in uh, the northern india we have many sites with wall paintings and they don't use egg uh, because they are totally um, vegan vegetarians and also they use uh, some other vegetable glue and all so they are also at times called tempera but the true tempera is the one that is done with egg as a binding medium tempera paintings executed with pigment ground in water miscible medium the word tempera originally came from the verb temper to bring to desired consistency so dry pigments are made usable by tempering them with a binding and adhesive vehicle this the painting in the background is from ajanta lora caves there's a lot of uh, contradiction and various uh, experts some say that they are tempera others say they are fresco some say they are both and um, i think a, a lot more scientific analysis needs to be done because uh, there are different caves and they are painted at different uh, periods of time though it is the same place the caves are located in the same uh, area but um, they have been they have been painted in different eras so um, they might have even the paintings um, uh, that i'll be showing again and the earlier slides also the site which i visited after 7 years i got the work got to work over after 7 years uh, they were um, there were different room they had the site had different rooms and all the rooms had different technique of plastering so even in ajanta lora caves i think uh, we need to study more uh, and uh, find out what the technique was there have been a lot of study on these paintings otherwise the tempered i have just taken the dictionary meaning of uh, tempered having elements mixed in satisfying proportions qualified or lessened or diluted by the mixture or influence of an additional ingredient so they are not pigments they have an additional ingredient to enhance its um, properties so we have egg pigment water so derived from the latin word temperare meaning to 
mix. Tempura is a mixture of medium bound with emulsions, liquid mixtures, dry mineral or organic pigment, and water to create a desired consistency. Here I would like to mention, I'm not very sure, but I, I read somewhere that uh, the earliest kind of tempura, I think they had, they used to mix oil and water also. Um, they had the emulsion, the emulsion they used was of oil and water. So egg tempera, the most common form of tempera uses pure egg yolk as a binder to hold all the ingredients together uh, to make a non-toxic fast drying paint. It is also the most durable of tempera paint because it is unaffected by humidity and temperature, so it does not fade over time. So this was about various forms of uh, frescoes from fresco to tempera, the techniques. Brief history of frescoes. The origins of fresco painting are unknown, but it was used as early as Manoan uh, Manoan civilization and by ancient Romans. The Italian Renaissance was the great period of fresco painting from late 13th to mid 16th century, around which time I think Sistine Ch Chapel and Raphael's uh, stanza murals in Vatican uh, were also made. And by the mid 16th century, however, the use of fresco had largely been supplanted by oil painting. The technique was briefly revived in 20th century. So this is the oldest fresco known. It has uh, actually been restored. So the portions in between are the original and rest of it is uh, uh, matched with the original color and the complete composition is shown in this uh, particular case. Anatomy of uh, frescoes. This is, I think we all know, um, we have the wall structure, which can be brick wall or stone also. I have seen both. So one of the temples that I, we worked was all uh, of stone. The structure was in stone and it was plastered. And uh, one of the mosques we worked on was all brick structure, again plastered in, with the proper technique of various layers of aricha and in Tunaco, the final layer. So Aricha is the, it, it is, uh, here it is just one layer shown, but there are two of such. One is coarse and the other one is a little finer than the earlier one. And on the top of it, we have in Tunaco. They are all basically, they have lime. All of these layers have lime, but the uh, percentage of lime increases as we move towards the final layer. So, and the final layer also cannot be pure lime because otherwise um, the pure lime is not a good, um, uh, can't act as a good binder and um, it might develop cracks because um, it will shrink much more uh, if there is no um, aggregate ad added to it, whether it is sand or anything, but it is quite white. Uh, the intonacos that we see in, even in India, the upper layer is quite white, which is because instead of sand in the uppermost layer, it is marble dust which is added. So it gives smoothness as well as that characteristic which is required, the air passages that are required uh, within the lime uh, molecules. There, there should be some kind of uh, uh, space for air to seep in and um, so we have these layers, uh, wall structure, Richa layers and Intonaco. This is a microscopic uh, picture, the cross section of uh, the same temple that we worked uh, recently, a few years back. And though it had, I'll show you a very contrast because uh, in one room there was a mud plaster, mainly mud plaster with straw and aggregates of fibers and all pieces of straw. And uh, the other one, the one uh, which is shown here, it had uh, more of lime. There's no mud, uh, less of sand, you can say. Uh, it is not mud, it is sand. But in the other room there was 
it was mainly mud. So here it is not mud, it is sand with lime and uh, some pieces of stones and all as aggregates. Um, so this uh, or, uh, this uh, 4.633 uh, millimeter of uh, thickness is of aricha, which is uh, the coarse plaster, uh, lime mixed with sand and aggregates. And uh, um, this portion is um, 0 0.581 millimeter. It is more of lime and a little bit of sand or marble dust. And over this, this painting, if you can see this blue the painting has been made. So talking about the chemistry, this is interesting and important uh, to understand fres frescoes. Uh, lime as a plaster of ground and binding medium, uh, it is acting as a ground as well as the binding medium. So this is uh, the basic thing about uh, Fresco. Now we have to understand this uh, cycle. Uh, it is very interesting. Uh, you see the picture on the left is limestone and the picture on the right is a fresco. And chemically they are same. Even in physical strength they are same. Though limestone, uh, limestone is one thing and we have, this is calcium carbonate um, and uh, calcium carbonate can be much harder than this limestone shown in this picture. The marble is also calcium carbonate. It depends on how it is um, prepared. Like if it is, it has been under the pressure of a lot of earth uh, um, at high temperature and pressure for a long time, then it will get uh, very hard and it will become marble. So, but we are talking about limestone and this fresco, they are chemically same. The difference is like you can also put uh, the painting pigment on the limestone itself. Uh, but what is interesting over here is that uh, we have, we can't um, manipulate the limestone itself. We can't put the pigment in, uh, uh, to make the pigment a part of it so that it doesn't wither away. So uh, what we do is, it's a long process, uh, a long in the sense, not very long, but uh, difficult. Um, limestone is calcined, means it is heated uh, at a very high temperature. And in the process, it loses its uh, carbon dioxide, if you see here. CO2 is removed and what is left is Ca calcium atom and oxygen CaO calcium oxide. So it is heated at a very high temperature to get this quick lime calcium oxide and this calcium oxide we can also uh, we'll just see in the next slide or uh, the next to that one um, what are the properties of these three things? We have calcium carbonate, calcium oxide, and we'll, we'll slake it, we'll put it in water, and we'll get calcium hydroxide, which is slake lime. So um, why can't we use just uh, calcium oxide? We'll just see in the properties. So we just uh, slake it, uh, means let it react with water. And uh, this slate lime, which is calcium hydroxide, is mixed with sand and it is kept wet also. And now this thing is in a paste form. So it can be applied on walls. And once it dries on the wall, it becomes again becomes calcium carbonate, the limestone. And before it dries, in the process of drying, uh, it takes up carbon dioxide, which it has it had lost. So water is removed and carbon dioxide is taken up from the air and instead of OH groups, CO3 group is added. Um, so um, the same uh, limestone or calcium oxide is prepared. But what we do uh, is that before it dries properly and before it converts prop into calcium carbonate, we add the pigment to it. We add the um, different kinds of minerals with a brush and water uh, onto the surface of this uh, lime plaster. 
which is still calcium hydroxide. And uh, as it turns into calcium carbonate, uh, it traps the pigment molecules. And now the pigment or the painting becomes a part of that stone or a part of that fresco. So fresco is basically the calcium carbonate with pigments, the way they are applied, whatever composition has been made. So uh, limestone is calcined to get quick, uh, quick lime, which is slaked with water. It is kept in water for a very long time, for many months, and it gets converted into calcium hydroxide. This calcium hydroxide, uh, which has been uh, kept in water for a very long time, six to seven months at least, is mixed with sand and water and a plaster is prepared and uh, frescoes are made on the wet plaster. As the plaster dries, it get, there's a chemical reaction and the calcium hydroxide is converted into calcium carbonate and the pigments are trapped in that structure. So now this is um, about uh, the structures, how this is the the largest circle here is calcium. The red ones are oxygen and this gray is, no, yeah, oxygen and the gray is uh, carbon. So this is calcium carbonate, CaCO3. This is converted into CaO and when it is put in water for a um, very long time, uh, this water is H2O. So these small little things are hydrogen molecule atoms and this is oxygen. So this is O. H2O. So it is like this. No. 2OH, yeah. So this is ox one oxygen was already there. H2O, yeah. This is H2O. And um, then it reacts with carbon dioxide to again to form calcium carbonate. The properties of calcium carbonate, calcium oxide, and calcium hydroxide. Uh, the uh, two most important properties that we want to know is the hardness, how strong and stable and dense they are. So calcium carbonate is 2.71 gram per cubic centimeter. Calcium oxide is 3.34 gram per cubic centimeter and uh, calcium hydroxide is 2.211 gram per cubic centimeter. So uh, calcium oxide is the most hard, but it reacts sparingly with uh, water. So we cannot use it for painting. It will be destroyed if uh, there's a lot of, uh, if it is kept in water for a long time, it will get converted into calcium hydroxide. Talking about the solubility in water, calcium carbonate is insoluble in water. So uh, soluble, it is, it dissolves in water if the pH of water is acidic. In that case, it might dissolve in water. So acid rain might damage the fresco paintings. And um, as far as the calcium, uh, calcium oxide is concerned, it, it, there's no question of dissolving. It just reacts with water and it is uh, quite um, exothermic. It uh, releases a lot of energy while this reaction is taking place. And calcium hydroxide is soluble in water but it is very interesting that uh, as the temperature is increased, normally what we see if we dissolve sugar in water or, or um, salt in water, as you increase the temperature, the solubility increases. Uh, salt or sugar would dissolve in warm water much better than in cold water. But in this particular case, um, uh, as you increase the temperature, the solubility decreases. So uh, at zero degrees Celsius, it is more soluble than at 100 degrees Celsius. So it is called retrograde solubility. This is something interesting. And we can talk about it, but I don't think we'll have enough time. It is already around eight and I have a lot to talk about uh, in frescoes. And um, uh, it is very interesting that why this happens if you see the chemical reaction. So, uh, without aggregates like sine, and we have seen that lime is uh, how the lime is changing. Uh, it is uh, first we take limestone, which is converted into uh, quick lime, which is converted into slake lime, and slake lime is. Uh, 
acting uh, is being used as a plaster. Now, without aggregates, if we don't add that sand as we had uh, was shown in this uh, diagram, that it is mixed with sand and water, mixed with sand and water. If we don't mix it with sand, water is already there. If we don't mix it with sand, then the lime is not that durable and it would crack and uh, the binding would also not be proper. So we have to use some aggregates uh, in the lime to create those air spaces to let carbon dioxide reach the depths of the plaster and uh, the aggregates that are used in lime plaster include particles of sand or crushed rock or stone or marble. As pure lime putty dries, it contracts and eventually cracks. So when bonded to an aggregate like sand or marble dust, shrinkage is limited by the amount of rock particles that can fit in a particular volume. You can just imagine like if you, um, if you want to make a fist out of your hand, you fold your fingers and uh, you can make a tight fist. Uh, this is how the contraction of uh, the lime is happening. They are coming close and this might create cracks because they're different uh, particles of lime. And, uh, but if there is some sand, you can just imagine that you have put some stones or pebbles in your hand and then you are making a fist, then it won't go that far. It won't be that tight. So uh, this is what is happening in case of lime plaster. We need that uh, little space created by sand or crushed rock and stones. And in many cases, we have seen that painting is uh, done on a thin layer of lime with an average of 0.4 millimeters spread on a layer of brown clay, sand, chopped straw, and paddy husk in thickness of about three to five millimeter. And th these are the cases where we have worked and I wanted to show you the pictures. Uh, in the same, on the same side, we have rooms where a lot of good lime plastering has been done in various layers of aricho and intonaco. But here uh, you can see the mud plaster. You can see the fibers of uh, the straw and uh, paddy husk. It is cut and added to this uh, mud plaster. Here also you can see this area is exposed and it is, the picture is not that good, but uh, you can see the fibers, vegetable fibers added to the mud plaster to form that grip. And over that a very thin layer of uh, lime has been added uh, and painted over. This is a bit, I have just cropped the picture. It's not a better uh, version, but uh, you can see at a, as a closer view. Another close up of the same picture, you can see the straw has the fibers coming out of this broken area. And the, you can see the paint layer, the line, layer of lime here. It is so thin and it is uh, then painted over as compared, of course, I wanted to go back to that picture as compared to the one where instead of husk, instead of the straw or fibers, stone particles, the pieces of crushed stone and uh, brick are added. Now talking about the nature of colors. Now in frescoes, it is very important to understand even in tempera, all colors, you can't use all the colors. Some colors are not good for frescoes. Though in tempera, you have wider range as compared to fresco, but there are a few uh, pigments which cannot be used nicely, properly in tempera also. So uh, the selection of proper colors for painting in fresco is among the most important parts of the art. And all the best authorities on the subjects are unanimous in the opinion that natural colors only are proper to be used in fresco painting. Reds are, now we'll talk about, I'll just take, uh, though I, I think I have a slide on green also, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about yellows also. Um, black, we have carbon black and uh, there are some other blacks also from magnesium compounds and all and some other rocks and uh, 
uh, we'll talk about greens also, but the main, the main pigments that I'll take uh, would be reds and blues. Reds are quite abundant and blues are not at all abundant. They're very difficult to procure and even if we get the blue pigment, it is not very durable. Either it fades or changes the color to some other gray or green, even green or black. So uh, reds are abundant, blues are not. So uh, not every red clay or stone makes a good pigment though, though they are very abundant, but um, they, uh, it's not that any you can take any red earth and it would be a good pigment for the painting. So not uh, every red clay or stone makes a good pigment or even a usable pigment. Ochres to be good must consist of very uh, consist very largely of the colored salts of iron and not as most arts do contain uh, in much feebly colored clay. So it should have more of uh, iron compound than of uh, you can say the colored clay and um, uh, deposits of pure iron oxide in the form of hematite were regarded as, the, as an important source of red color in the Middle Ages. Amatito is uh, a variety of hematite. It is very interesting. I've taken these pictures from internet. I didn't have uh, such material right now for this presentation. And uh, from Creative Commons I've taken, uh, their daughter, uh, the person who has clicked the picture is not known or it can be used freely on internet. So um, this is a very, and this was very commonly used and even mistaken for, there were pigments which were mistaken for Amatito, but it was very good uh, material and at times it, there was a confusion whether it is cinnabar which is uh, toxic, which is mercury. This is not mercury, this is iron compound, hematite. So it was confused with that also, but uh, it is not mineral cinnabar. It is a variety of hematite and it is hard and very uh, rich in color, very commonly used uh, as pigment and also as a burnisher. If you, there is a proper procedure given in some of the texts of, um, from the artists of middle ages, how you have to create a burnishing stone out of this uh, rough kind of stone that you have uh, got. So how you have to smoothen it and then use it as a burnisher. So it is, uh, it was um, commonly used as a, for burnishing gold also after smoothening. And uh, of, of course you can crush it, grind it and use it as a pigment also. Sinopia is another example of uh, this, uh, hematite and in classical antiquity the great source of red ochres was uh, Pontus uh, oxenus and the choicest, choicest red earth came from the Pontine city of Sinope and uh, this red was valuable uh, monopoly and the ancient Greece and Rome looked to Sinope to maintain the quality of its product. To guard against substitutions of the color, the color was sold under a sea. Now we don't know what kind of steel it was, it is just, um, uh, we can think of that it must be stamped into the cakes of the color and was known as the sealed sinope. So it was the genuine sinope, uh, the red, uh, red pigment which was uh, acquired from sinope, that city. So in the Middle Ages, the name Sinope came to be applied to other earths of less distinction and the Latin and Italian word Sinopia came to mean simply red ochre. But initially it was basically that particular red pigment which was acquired from the city of Sinope. And it was very good in color and uh, it had a stamp on it. But now, uh, later on, and even this term was then until now is being applied to the underdrawing of the frescoes which was done with this red color. Cinnabar is mercuric sulfide. I have not written over here. I'm sorry and uh, it is toxic though it is bright brilliant red but it is toxic and these are the oldest examples of uh, the frescoes and the pigments used uh, on walls. Now blue colors, so this was, uh, the earlier picture was also to show that uh, in earlier paintings, blue was very less, was not used much. It was mainly reds, yellows and greens. E even in Ajanta Alora paintings, cave paintings, we have mostly the pastel colors like ochres, red, greens, browns, uh, very little blue. 
and but in the paintings of later period they have a lot of blue because uh, new pigments were um, invented and discovered also blue colors the palomino rightly said is again an art, a writer uh, of earlier times he said that blue pigments are sila of fresco painting sila is um, uh, the sea demon and uh, he said so because uh, he had seen many instances of uh, their want of durability and their discordance with other colors of the picture blue pigments mentioned by various artists in their writings are cerulean or um, vestorian azure or egyptian egyptian blue i'll just men i'll just talk about it this is something important azuro because blue pigments were not very common they were not durable so we'll be talking about some important blue pigments so egyptian blue it was one of the durable pigments and it was i think the first um, uh, synthetic pigment uh, azuro smalto and ultramarine so these are the most commonly used or mentioned uh, pigments used in frescoes and tempera paintings azurite is soft deep blue copper mineral produced by withering of copper ore deposits depending on the degree of fineness to which it was ground and its basic content of copper carbonate it gave a wide range of blues so uh, this is a mineral of copper copper compound and uh, we'll see uh, that uh, i don't know if i have kept that slide or not if i mentioned in later slide or not that this particular blue is very bright blue deep blue but as you grind it the finer you grind it uh, the lesser blue it becomes it becomes it turns to gray grayish kind of material so if you have want to put something bright blue on your fresco painting you have to uh, you have to keep in mind that you don't have to grind it too much so um, it uh, its color changes as you grind it and um, let's see a little more about as you write it is one of the two basic copper carbonate minerals the other being green which is malachite we have uh, i have just uh, discussed all this chemistry in uh, con in another session of paper conservation where we were talking about pigments uh, used in miniatures and all so this is very interesting that copper uh, carbonate minerals there are two basic copper carbonate minerals one is blue other is green one is azurite the other is malachite azurite is unstable in open air uh, compared to the malachite and often is pseudomorphically replaced by malachite now what is pseudomorphical replacement it is like um, the shape and uh, uh, okay so we were talking about um, as you write can you all hear me okay, on chat okay it then so i'm sharing the screen again uh so we were talking about as a right it is very unstable in uh, it is a blue pigment and unstable in op open air comparable to malachite and often is pseudomorphically replaced by malachite this weathering process involves replacement of some of the carbon dioxide units with water 
changing the carbonate hydroxide ratio of as you write from 1 ins to 1 to 1 ins to 2 ratio of malachite so in as you write there are two carbonate groups and two hydroxyl groups while in malachite there is one carboxyl group and two hydroxyl groups so um carbon dioxide is lost in this case in case of lime we saw that carbon dioxide was added and water was lost but here carbon dioxide is lost no addition of water from above equation the con uh, con uh, conversion of azurite to malachite is attributable to the low partial pressure of carbon dioxide in air this is again chemistry i won't go into it this is an example in this uh, painting the cloak was initially painted in blue because uh, it is supposed to be a sacred color maybe because of its rarity or it being expensive um blue is often uh, considered sacred so but this was azurite and it turned into malachite and in this picture though it is looking like black but it is it is actually dark green much azurite was mislabeled lapis lazuli a term applied to mineral pigment any blue pigments and uh, as chemical analysis of pigments from middle ages improves azurite is being recognized as a major source of blues used by medieval painters lapis lazuli the pigment ultramarine lapis lazuli is the stone lapis means stone uh, when it is crushed we get the pigment blue pigment which is called ultramarine was chiefly supplied from afghanistan during the middle ages whereas azurite was a common mineral in europe at the time so we are talking about azurite so it was more common in europe it was more frequently used as compared to its counterpart which is ultramarine or lapis lazuli heating can be used to distinguish azurite azurite from purified natural ultramarine blue because there was a confusion whether the blue used in a painting is uh, from azurite or ultramarine so uh, we can use heating to distinguish if we have the pigments uh, extra pigments so when um, ultramarine withstands heat whereas azurite converts black converts to black color black copper oxide however gentle heating of azurite produces a deep blue pigment used in japanese painting techniques this is that interesting um, old picture wall painting from um, uh manuen uh, time manin uh, and um, it is called cerulean or egyptian paint, blue and what is interesting about this this is a yeah, manuen uh, fresco manuen dolphins these are around 3500 years old and what is interesting about this is that as you write uh, in middle ages which is which is much ahead of this particular time this is older um uh, artists were using azurite and it wasn't stable it wasn't durable it used to change uh many thousands year before them around 2 3000 before 1000 uh, years before them were artists who were actually using more durable blue this is still so bright you can see in the picture um this is actually calcium copper silicate and it is the considered as the first um synthetic pigment and uh, uh, the artist and writer very well known writer of that time has um very nicely described its manufacture its how it was prepared and he had himself rather um was running a business he had a factory of creating this particular um pigment so it was a uh, you know, vitruvius and these are his words how not in english of course uh, it is translated into english what he has written about how this particular egyptian blue was prepared so instead of using azurite as such uh they were doing some uh something to it uh they took sand and it was ground up like a flour to a fine flour like thing and copper containing minerals were added to it mainly azurite you can say made with coarse file like grass the whole uh, is sprinkled with water the whole th this mixture of uh, sand 
copper mineral and uh, um, copper fillings they were make, uh, they were sprinkled with water so that they adhere together and balls were made out of them they used to create balls um, and uh, by working with hands and these balls are uh, laid to side uh, aside to dry and when dry they were put in an earthen jar and um, it was put in fire and then when the copper and sand have united boiling together by vehemence of fire giving and receiving vapors of each other they lose their own properties and being united all together by force of fire they become a blue color so <laughs> this is these are his words but basically they were grinding the sand and copper uh, minerals as you write and um, also natron natron is sodium by baking soda and a mixture of baking soda and salt so all this was crushed uh, with a flower of nitrile it's written so sand natron and the copper mineral and they were sprinkled with water balls were made and laid to dry then put in the earthen jar and jar is put in fire and we get uh, after uh, whatever that ball is fired or it is heated for long <clears throat> it is then crushed and the pigment is we get the pigment which is much more durable it has lasted thousands of years so these are the pigments that i wanted to talk about basically i'll just go through them again the reds uh, main red is uh, amatito the hematite sinopia is also hematite cenobar not used now because it is toxic and um, uh, reds are abundant sienna is um, burnt sienna is reddish uh, raw sienna is yellow when you heat it you get a reddish tinge and uh, burnt sienna is reddish so all the red ochres red earths hematite the red blues are not that abundant in nature even here i would like to mention one more thing even the blue of the peacock feather it is not um uh, let me just first stop sharing and then i'll cut back to this uh, that is not actually because of the blue pigment or blue color in its feather and there are many butterflies which are blue but it is not the uh, blue pigment that they have whether organic or inorganic uh, it is just how light is passing through them and the blue color is uh, it is uh, dispersed easily and it looks blue so most of the blues that we see in nature even the blue sky or sea water it is because of the reflection of light the way it is reflected it is not because of um, the um, pigment or the uh, the color of uh, the compound itself so i'll just go back to screen sharing and um, yeah so blues are rarely seen in nature and they even they are not durable if they are seen so this is the ceruleum or egyptian blue is the first synthetic pigment which is blue which is durable and small to again is um, it is more glass like so it is good for frescoes and uh, ultramarine is from lapis lazuli that is again bright blue mostly it was ultramarine that was used um, uh, in the old paintings frescoes and temperas so we talked about red hematite and now talking about um, blues azurite we talked about and from azurite and azurite like azurite is not durable it turns into malachite this we talked about and um, uh, from azurite we got egyptian blue by the process of mixing it with sand and nitre and uh, heating it and then crushing it so this is about blue uh, first synthetic pigment is blue red is abundant in nature uh, then green pigments are again quite abundant, easily available, like malachite mainly, terra verde, and uh, these are the various stones or minerals uh, which gave us the green pigments. Yellow ochres, sienna is yellow, and if you burn it, burnt sienna is red. So I won't go into all that. Lime itself can be used as white, 
and we have lead whites, which is not good because it change, uh, changes chemically. Then we, have, then we have titanium white, zinc white, and uh, black is generally carbon. So that is all for today.